males are seen as superior and we have things like pornography that are actively making females like a subspecies. You know, how are the powers that be trying to corrupt us and control us, right? Break it down into even like the simple biological steps of that. There are a number of things, particularly with technology, that we do opt out of. And I think increasingly with these external factors really influencing our family making dynamics and opportunities, that is having an implication, I think, even more so than having kids because the means of getting to that point are really not in place in the way that they were even 50 years ago. Pre-industrial society is not necessarily going to have the same expectations on the individual and, th and that's going to change how people relate to their gender roles as they're prescribed. I think there's just this conflict of interests between women and men that really don't help anyone. I don't know how I don't know if we want to make this into another topic, but <laughs> I had a I had a really interesting question uh, for Johnny, because um, you said I assume that you are an AFAB person. I am, yeah. And you said that you don't feel commonality with uh, females. Correct. Yeah. I think you're lying. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. I have to go. You think I'm <laughs> lying about... Okay, well, let me let me explain a couple of things to you. Um, number one, I've known that I didn't want children since I was like 10. Number two, I'm six feet tall. I'm six one. Uh, okay. Number three, I've always women been... Can't, highly... Women have to be mothers and they can't be tall. Got it. No, no. What I'm saying is that the experience of being I guess you're I guess you're equating like the sex you're not talking about gender and so I'm I'm talking about a couple of things that separate me from the gender but well, I when I say that I don't harmful. okay she, I think gender is a stop 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 you gotta when let her respond that, laugh you like, gotta let, let her answer, answer. like yeah. we, we know Weppy, we know I got this I got this Weppy, Weppy, I don't need to moderate let me set when up when I say that I don't think asshole I don't experience a commonality with 51% of the human population. No, absolutely not. Like, I don't experience a commonality with people who feel like they have been uh, not taken seriously. I'm generally taken very seriously when I engage in conversations. Um, I don't experience, like, a lot of the, like, gendered stuff. And so that keeps me farther away from being able to say, okay, but everyone who has a vagina, like, we're, we're all the same. Like, I don't experience that even to a further degree. Okay, well, I would argue that that's where I think that gender is actually harmful and reductive. I think that genderism uh, is like the death. I think that it is inherently misogynistic. Uh, to say that all women should have kids, or I think that everyone is non-binary, truly, and that sex is the only thing that matters, but also that it doesn't matter at all. Um, so, yeah, I'd go as far as to say, like, Interesting. Um, I'm like, curious, where does, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Kidology, where, where do you stand on this? I'm, I'm curious, since you are here, we have your opinion. Uh, if you would like to, if you want to stay out of it, just let me know. I oh, know this is I, uh, this is why I want to I want to think about this because that was a very interesting question. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this I'd relates. Like to, uh, not so erudite uh, wants in too, so we're gonna bring not so erudite in in a second. But uh, yeah. Play. Oh my god, it's a fucking it's a it's a mostly girl party in here. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think um, what I was gonna say was that uh, there are commonalities even if you don't feel like I don't like to fucking cook. I don't like uh, I'm not really looking forward to getting pregnant. Like there are certain things like that where I'm just like not. But there's a there's a commonality in which you know not being taken seriously and equating that to womanhood is um very offensive to me i think do you think that that's uh, not an oppression given like that that's generally something that i hear talked about when people talk about the sure. oppression of women sure but i but there are other things also so like i think that i think that most people would view you as a as a feminine person i think that most people look at you and and think that you are that you are female i hope that i'm not offending you um, You're not so, offending me. No, I'm a I'm a very realistic person on that standpoint. I'm okay, like, yeah. sick. I I really truly I'm not I'm not saying that to offend you. I'm I'm just saying that because it, it I think it speaks to my point. Um, in that so when we live in like a in a society like we do, and uh, you know, males are seen as superior, and we have things like pornography that are actively uh, making 
like women or females, like a, like a, like a subspecies. Um, there are going to be ways that males act in your presence that will affect you regardless of whether or not you subscribe to them. Okay. And I don't generally experience that in a way that but you are a female, so you control. experience Roe v. Wade. You, ex- you, ex- you experience now, you're experiencing with the rest of people who have uteruses that we don't have like autonomy over our, our bodies. And in, in is that enough? Way. Is that enough to make like, because there is a common human experience. We all die. A female? There's a common human no, no, my, oh, to, to clarify my question. And therefore, wanting abortions to be a fact in our modern day society. Yeah, there's a common human experience in that. But is it enough? Well, I'm, I'm I saying guess, someone, to make so, it so there aren't laws around there aren't laws around men doing that though is what I'm saying. Like there there are laws around women and what they can do with their bodies and not men. Besides, like you know, like do not rape, obviously. Um, but that's not really your body. That's still you're using it for some, infringing on someone else's rights. Um, so there's there's just like commonalities like that that are going to affect you regardless of whether or not you subscribe to them. I appreciate what you're trying to say in that I physically have those parts. I I feel like I feel like that's a big stretch to say that abortion as a topic affects every single female in the same way. Um I I also think that Well, it doesn't have it, to be in the same way. Okay, you're just saying that it's generally affected. So, so you're saying that yeah. men are not affected by abortion laws at all? Uh, I don't think I ever made that claim. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, it, I think that they're secondarily affected, right? So, like, if if your if your partner can't get an abortion, I think that that affects you. But I don't think that that's not a law made on a male body. Okay. Yeah. So. Because 51% of the population has the ability to be legislated, whether they are literally being legislated or not, because there are women who can't have children and there are women who don't engage in birth control at all. Um, Slay. But I'm you're one saying of them. That, yeah. So you're saying that generally this entire uterus legislation is something that affects us all and therefore I should. Well, be- not even just legislation i don't even think just legislation i think the the war on the female body is uh all encompassing um i think it starts from the moment that we start existing uh through i think i mean it's been proving that you know parents treat their their female children softer differently um the way that you grow up i i assume that you haven't been you know transgender for your whole life i assume throughout you know some of your girlhood you were treated like a girl would be you have a common experience of being um spoken down to uh you know there's uh vaginal shame there's uh the fact that we we bleed every month and yet uh you know we still have to buy period products uh there's you know there's period shame there's you know cooties there's slut shaming if you sleep with someone in a way that is just not going to there are there are commonalities between the female experience that are just it's all encompassing from like yeah, from the moment we're born. You're talking about a very <laughs> wide ranging experience of yeah. the Western female, yeah. And I'm I'm sitting here and I'm telling the global you global female, I think. I, I would I would say a lot of the things that you mentioned, like slut shaming and other things, they they vary from continent to continent. I mean, I would say it's culture. probably the best. I would say like we're probably the least slut shaming. I think if you go to most other yeah. countries and cultures, you'll see. <laughs> way more yeah. slut shaming we're pretty progressive yeah i mean if stuff. you want to talk about globally we can talk about like female uh, circumcision right like we can talk about f- genital mutilation in other countries like we have the question is do you good... identify with that i mean and i think what, yeah. to, to reference something that kidology not, we've it, been well, talking about thing, earlier really well, nice do, to, yeah, to, stop 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 we gotta let weppy ask her to, question then you can respond live go ahead just to reference earlier the way kidology described you know, her, the way she looks at hyper individualism, both on the left and the right, and, and the ways to differentiate. Um, one of the, the, the differences, I think, is 
looking at identity as something which kind of defines you, these external realities, which I'm not necessarily arguing with. It's a range of possible realities, and many of those have happened to me. Not all of them, but yeah, of course, I'm going to relate to people who share experiences with me. But do I identify with that? Do I identify with shell shaming? When I talk about my identity, that's that it doesn't necessarily, it, it obviously defines my built world that I live in and I make decisions within, but that's not really how I feel in a core sense of self. And I think what Kidology is talking about is this, this bigger, this deeper sense of self, which is actually more than um, the reality which is constructed around you and which is something that you're constantly aspiring to 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 reach to. I think it's it, I think it's it's bigger than than these signifiers. And just just well, for I, everyone's I information you. before you go, just for everyone, we have one more guest that'll be joining us, Real Femme Explainer, uh, I believe, Ali Drummond. So we'll bring her in as soon as she gets here. Um I, I agree with you and I would I would say that uh woman is not an identity. It is a set of experiences that uh that form your reality. I would say that um, I think that that's the What's problem the between with genderism. Yeah. What's the difference between like a set experience... of experiences that form your so, reality versus an identity piece? So just, I'm, not, I'm asking in good faith. I'm just clarifying that. Yeah. So I don't identify as as a woman. I am one. Right. Like I don't identify with these rigid set of rules or these uh, you know certain sets of experiences that I'm like this one feels good. Right. I experience my life from from the moment I was born, and then my reality is informed by my biological reality, which is not something I can identify out of. Yeah, and what I'm saying is that exactly to your point, I experience the set of technically having a female body. That doesn't mean that I have anything in common other than the very, like on the surface level of having a female body. And in fact, well, that's all you I'm, need. That's all often, you need. I'm often treated as a man because I'm often mistaken as a man. Like that's, that's something, especially when I had short hair, like I was often treated as a man until I either spoke or um, someone just made, made a lot of like assumptions based on not being able to tell, you know? And so I, I don't, have this extremely um connective experience with other people i'm more of a gender capitalist if anything like if you if you need me to look female for a job i'll do my best to look female but like even that is is kind of difficult for me in some occasions and so it's it's weird to me that i'm like <laughs> being told that i'm lying when I say that my core experience is not that of me expressly being female or that my experience that guides my day-to-day -day life is not commonality with every other 51% of the population female. Well, that's, but again, that's not what, that's not what I've, I've said. So I think that every single woman here has had a different experience and probably brutally different, right? Like, I mean, yeah, I think that it's been completely different, but we, but but it is still informed by our biological reality is what is what I would say. Even even yeah, and my even biological though, reality even is have different from yours. Experience. My biological but, reality is different from yours. I don't imagine like you look like a relatively small person. You probably don't dress very like masculine on a regular basis. Like you don't seem do. like a person who would be mistaken for a man. But that's a regular experience for me. And so, like, the androgyny sure. of that leads me away from being expressly connected to everyone else who shares my genitals. Sure, but there are certain experiences that you can certainly opt out of, but you cannot opt out of a biological reality. What is that biological reality, though? Like, I have had the, a really hard time understanding female. what you think. Okay, and I'm I'm expressing to you that my experience of being female is highly different but that's, from yes, a lot of every, the things that you describe. I'm, I'm expressing to you that every that every okay. female has a different experience, yet we are all still female. And that's all I think, all I you think need we would. To okay, so why I think we would. I, well, if I could jump in, I, I would Please. say like probably all of us would agree that there's a number of biological components that women experience that women can also opt out of, right? You can take back-to-back -back birth control and never have periods. You can uh, get your uterus removed and never have periods, right? You can have your breasts removed. So there's like a number of things that like, there is an element of like, even when we're talking about like being female and identifying as female and like that experience, when we break it down into even like the simple biological steps of that, there are a number of things, particularly with technology that we do opt out of regularly. Um, 
Yeah. In adulthood, I would yeah. agree with you. No, and I uh, want to express think, this really think, quick. Uh, I want to express this really quick. One second, one second. Because we have people, we have people who are a little bit confused in the chat. We have people who are probably just coming in. This is a discussion on whether or not I experience a community or a commonality that I believe in or that I experience with other females. This is not a, this is not whether or not I'm female, y'all. I am female. This is, do I experience that commonality? And my answer is no. And yet I was told that I was lying about it. Because so you, you experience, you experience femaleness because you are a female and that's, that's all you need. I want to, I want to give some, I just real quick, just ladies, just real quick. I want to, I want to give uh, some space, <laughs> right. To, to some of the other people to, to kind of, of get in here if they wish. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm unfamiliar with, uh, Ali. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I should probably change my name on this. Um, I'm still kind of a, a boomer for Discord, so I don't know how the buttons work. Um, but I have a right click your name and you can change it if you right click your image. How dare you tell me Sorry. this out loud? <laughs> I was All about right, to explain you. it, but I'll then I was going to be yelled at. Steps yeah. afterwards, okay? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I actually wanted to hop in because I was talking to a friend um, about this earlier. So he's an atheist anarchist. He's much more articulate than me. Um, and he, he made a really good point where, like, it's possible that there could be, okay, like an end goal where the transgender ideology, and I'm talking about, like, the ideology, not the experience, okay, when people are trying to, like, propagandize others. Um, he was saying that it, it probably will if the powers that be are trying to, I don't know, like, oppress humans that it would probably lead to like a transhumanist movement. Because if you think about it, like a lot of the angst that's, you know, a lot of the angst and the dichotomy that's out there, um, if you are born male or female, you automatically by birth share an identity with 50% of the population. But if you pursue more of a trans experience in your life, then you immediately trade that 50% identification with half the global population for like 1% identification, like a sharing identifier. So naturally you're going to feel more lonely and alienated, but th I think that's like kind of the cost of it. His point was more so that like eventually <laughs> we're gonna start questioning whether or not we're human. And that's an identity that we share with 100% of the population and uh, the devastating and, um, effects of that. Cause I mean, it's hard. Like if you think about it, what are the chances if you decide to switch your gender um, let's say you're born female and I guess you want to identify as male. I think, I think you might be non-binary. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> cause I just got here. Okay. So I don't know, <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're born male and you want to be a virtuous man, you'll probably have an easier time doing that, identifying with your biological sex than if you were born a male and wanted to be a virtuous woman. So that was just something interesting that we had, um, discussion over dinner about that I thought was like surprisingly kind of applicable to this conversation. Cause of course you're going to have a very unique experience. You you're sharing an identity with 1% of the population. That's really hard to do. Who were you addressing that to? I'm sorry. I, I think you, I'm not sure. Cause you were saying that you're female and then I like, I got in, in a heated moment. Yeah. So I have like no idea I who saying, identifies as what. <laughs> I was, I was just saying that I'm female, but that I don't experience like a shared like union with, specifically female people the way that i would share a more generalized union with as you said the human population i am a human and i am a female and those experiences are not lost on me however that there's been a huge array of changes in that experience um especially since uh I live in a more masculine body and because I don't experience a lot of the very gendered things. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, trying to express that um, my sex is not something that I look to and I'm like, okay, this defines all of the experiences in any given portion of my life because it doesn't. Yeah. You're saying so it's like, not an you... identity. Yeah, for for you that's true, no, but for I'm most people that... it's it's not. You oh, know what I mean? For sure. For sure, and yeah. I'm not arguing that. This was specifically because I Lav said I experienced I a commonality. Of lying. I forget. <laughs> yeah, you accuse me of lying essentially, and so I'm just over here like I'm trying to be very charitable with, with you girl. Like I'm trying to <laughs> fucking express to you something that you may not I experience. was inflammatory. 
thank you yeah yeah, sure. let, let her finish and then you you can respond if you'd like uh i want to give I, uh johnny all the space that they need so go ahead johnny it's cool dude like i'm i'm just trying to express to you it's i have these conversations a lot where i express to people things that they don't necessarily themselves experience okay and so the facts of my biology are very clear to you because i've told them to you However, the facts of my life experience are not very clear to you. And so I'm mm -hmm. trying to be charitable. I'm trying to explain to you that I don't feel the same way about the female experience that you do. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I don't know. Like, whenever, whenever I'm allowed to chime in, let me know. Because I've never been here before. So Okay. Ahead, so, uh, oh, well, okay. since, since uh, you're all here, right, and uh, some of you are new, um, uh, I, I have a very low-key moderation style. Um, if everyone's talking over each other, I will interject and I will uh call balls and strikes as you but otherwise feel free to just assert yourself get in there mm -hmm. don't raise your hand no one's good it's not school no one's gonna call on you okay but just get in there uh what i'll keep you? you all in line trust, trust me i i can handle a lot of okay. women at once so don't don't worry about me go ahead <laughs> oh wow okay. do, you, do you guys uh do you guys think that a lot of women now um are kind of lost on part of the female experience because we're not having as many children I I think uh, I I think um, our view of gender is so fucked uh, mm -hmm. because it gender ideology was made up by a patriarchal biology system. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that one. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> and and part of and part of John Money, who is like known as like the founder of mm -hmm. you know gender ideology or genderism. Uh, part of why gender exists is to rationalize women being at home. Um, so all of this, uh, you know, when when a when a female says like, "Oh, I I don't identify with um, being over sexualized," or or I don't identify with all these things, and and you know, all these people say, "Well, I don't feel like a woman." Well, woman isn't a feeling. Woman is a state of being, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no there's no you. Yeah, I, I would just argue to say that there's no genderism doesn't mean really anything when you this, take away this uh, is not like true. a harmful sexual stereotype. The, gender like, doesn't mean much. So it is possible that like gender ideology started from like a bad place. It, that I'm totally willing to grant that. The issue is that like gender is not meaningless. It necessarily isn't. It's deeply meaningful, right? Just because gender exists on a spectrum doesn't mean that it's just like irrational or that it is meaningless, right? Like it, you're equating women to like a lot of these like biological processes, like uterus, period, cramps, That's all I uh, think abortion. Yeah. Okay, but like elderly women are still women when they experience none of these processes, right? Like we would sure, still call an elderly but women. But, but that's, but an elderly woman has experienced those processes and even, and people bring this up all the time to me. They say, oh, you know, like what if a woman can't have children? And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that's still a biological disease that affects a, a female reproductive system like that's not, mm -hmm. that's not engenderment that's and just to be clear engenderment came way before john money existed we just didn't have the language for it sure. like if you go yeah, back to know. ancient literature we're still talking about the feminine and the masculine like th this idea that like gender is just sex essentialism is just like so strange to me because it's such it's such a devoid I'm, like leap mm -hmm. away from the way that we actually interact with things like parts of our identity like our femininity or our masculinity like these things are engendered necessarily and in part by our culture right so like of course gender exists of course it does just because john sure. Money came up I, with the I word know that if i may interject just real quick ladies if i may interject um since it is kidology's birthday i want to give her some space okay. too to, to, I just want to let everyone know it's her birthday, but I want to, I, uh, I know birthday. that we started with you being unsure and needed to think, has this helped you at all? Have you come to any, at least tentative conclusions from this discussion yet? I just want to give you some space here. That's all. I do still need to think, but I do agree with not so erudite about this idea of, uh, especially about, uh, sort of sex essentialism, um, and the importance of gender. I think gender is very profound and I think that's why it is so debated and so contentious, especially now when there are so many voices having a say on gender and gender identity. I'm not sure if I have come to a, a sufficient or um, not so contradictory opinion about last question, especially uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I think just like a trivial example, for instance, when FD Signifier and um, his friends were reacting to me, one individual, uh, Professor Flowers, um, I noticed just going back on everything that um, Professor Flowers is, um, well, biologically female, but identifies as, um, at least uses the pronouns she, um, he. And I found myself, even now, incredibly, um, I just think drawn a lot more to Professor Flowers. And somebody in the chat just said, uh, you know, why are you being so charitable to this individual? And I couldn't explain it myself. And so it made me think about sort of this idea of sort of just affiliation, just for very irrational, emotive reasons, whether it is about, uh, I don't know, um, this biology of being female or what have you. And I do notice this in some interactions that I have as well. But in terms of a more uh, a more academic answer to this, um, I do have to think about it. I'm not sure at this point. I'm, I'm just afraid. curious. Thank you. Um, I kind of want to, and hopefully you can stay to hang out um, and hear my stuff. By the way, I subscribe to your channel, Kidology. I think you're so cool. Um, let me stop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, seriously, like a uh, super huge fan. It's been good to see you progress. So, um, okay, earlier I asked if, if um, any of you thought that there was a more comprehensive understanding of being a woman, being female, that is missing just because of the sheer amount of childlessness for modern women. So if you look at the UK, 50.1% of the female population is single and childless by 30. And we have these really fun, and I mean, I view them as fun, but I, I'm also Latina. So there's just some of the stuff that there, there's no way that I would ever like accept it culturally, um, like for myself. But, um, you know, the sex differences get pretty apparent once you reproduce. I'm kind of at a point in my life where I've determined that people um, have a really horrible understanding of femininity and masculinity just from that and that alone. That's an entire chapter of your life that a lot of women are not in in initiating these days just because of their own reasons. But um, even my professors that were egalitarian and social constructivists, the game changed really quick once they had children. Uh, and they found that, you know, the wife could stay up more. She was more sensitive to the children and the dad, he would sleep more. Um, so I think we like to play around with this stuff, but I would wager to bet that if, if any of you decide to have children, it's going to call a lot of things into question. And I have friends that are egalitarian, but you know, yet still it will change. Once a woman is pregnant, you'll be relying on your uh, man partner a lot more. I've done that already. So I think these are fun conversations, but I also think these are very American Western conversations. If you go to like Latin America, the whole Latinx thing, uh, that's purely Americanized. And I actually think it's Imperial, but uh, I have a bachelor's degree in anthropology. So the gender is a social construct that's coming from Margaret Mead. She went and observed other cultures that had more than man and woman, right? Because that's what America would have under their Abrahamic underpinnings. But uh, so she would see cultures that had three or four genders. So you could go for masculine man, feminine woman, masculine woman, um, and then feminine man. She never saw a finite number of genders. And that's where I'm like, this no longer makes any kind of sense. There, there, there can't be a finite amount of genders because we just decided to make it up um, in modernity. I mean, maybe other people feel that way, but that's not what she observed. And yet somehow from her work, we are now here in 2023, where now people are trying to be like non-binary, which is, it's their prerogative, but I think that's really hard to do because you have to try not to look like a man and not to look like a woman. And I don't know how, I mean, that just sounds really tough. Uh, th there's a lot there. I think the question that you posed originally of uh, essentially is, is femininity emptied in part due to the, like the lack of motherhood, mm -hmm. uh, probably to some extent in the same way that probably masculinity is emptied by lack of fatherhood, because not because I think like these two things are essential to the masculine and feminine, but they're, they are core parts. But I think child rearing in general demands a maturity, uh, like it, it requires it. And we have a population that's being forced into this like maturing process, isn't being forced. They're, they're opting for this maturing process later for a number of reasons, right? Um, and a lot of reasons are just benign and neutral and totally okay. But I think as a result of that, um, it, it, doesn't it, people are not being forced to like engage in some level of like kind of maturing and grass touching that I think like children necessitate people to do, um, for sure. 
um, about the gender stuff. Um, I, be, I mean, I think non-binary is a lot of times almost like a, it's almost like a political aesthetic of rejection of gender, right? And so like, I can kind of make space for it because it's, it's a space that says I am rejecting all of these things, right? I'm not falling into any of them. And that might not capture most non-binary people, but that's kind of the way I conceptualize it within like an engendered world in my view. Hmm. Um, I think uh, an answer... I... Sorry. Go ahead, Kodalji. Oh, oh, thank you. So I think in answer to your question, Ali, I think, at least from my perspective, I don't necessarily see it as just being about um, motherhood or not having children. I think it has, I would say just in simplistic terms, it has more to do with sort of the proliferation of prospective identities and life choices for women, which are more acceptable um, and the least acceptable, the most demonized, I at least find in sort of my environment is that of sort of going down the motherhood traditional route, uh, which is seen as very um, anti-progressive and seen as not where women should be. And then on the flip side, in terms of there being a lack of an expansion of identities for men, a lack of sort of opportunities, say, such as um, men being um, house husbands, say, um, or an acceptance of um, feminine men in Western societies and our societies. And I think at the same time, in terms of just there being that one idea and that one image of masculinity and what it means, there aren't the means or the uh, societal means which are making room or making space for that or allowing for that to happen. And so I think there's just this conflict of interests um, between women and men um, that really don't help anyone at all. So I think that's an issue. And with the UK, for instance, about 51% of women uh, being childless at 30, I think that also has to do with external circumstances such as the housing crisis in the UK. Um, I, for instance, cannot imagine having children because I live in, like most young people, in a shared house. I only have a bedroom. You're not allowed to have children, not allowed to have pets, um, anything like that. And I think increasingly with these external factors really influencing our family making dynamics and opportunities, that is having an implication. I think I would say even more so than just the idea of sort of having kids because the means of getting to that point are really not in place in the way that they were even 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say that, um, I would also say that all of us are transhuman at this point, uh, the way that we're connected to the internet, the way that we're connected to our phones, um, what? that, you know, gendered, gendered roles and, and this technological age where, you know, men would go out to the fields and the oil rigs and do what they did. It's all being automated now. So now that we're, you know, going up against the same jobs, programming, being doctors, being scientists. <laughs> OK, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to step in here. You think that's enough to make us transhuman? Uh, well, I don't think that we're transhuman right you, you now. Just, but yeah, you I think, just said I think in the that. way that our I mean, the phone is like a second brain. I... It's, it's, it's probably like an augmentation. So when I was talking yeah. about at the very beginning, because I think you're talking about how I said, um, you know, basically when you're born in male, female, you share uh, an, an identity with 50 percent of the population. So being being man, being woman. But if you pursue a trans gender um, identity for yourself, you only share that with one percent of the population. And so what my friend was theorizing, the atheist anarchist, he theorizes that it's going to bring more things into question because his perspective is, you know, how are the powers that be trying to corrupt us and control us, right? Not conspiratorial. He's just a really big thinker in that way. And uh, that would probably eventually lead to the question, well, it's like, I don't even identify as a human. And what consequences would that have if we deny an identity that we share with 100% of the population? So if, that's what I meant by transhumanist implications earlier. I, I heard this, I heard this one thing on a, like a trigonometry episode where some guy said that we're the only animals that think that we're gods and yeah, i thought I that, that was really interesting has he ever met a cat <laughs> yeah <laughs> true oh. but i i did i did just think that that was really interesting because we are really the only people who uh, disregard biological reality in pursuit of some like greater meaning mm -hmm. um which is interesting i think are, are we though i, I think feel like proud. humans have 
I feel like humans have been doing that forever. Like, yeah, you can, you can That's go back to That's what I'm saying. Like, humans do, humans well, are the only animals. That let do. Erudite finish oh, what okay. she's saying. And oh, if, if that's what you were saying, then I don't I don't need to yeah. keep going on. If you're saying that humans have always been defying and like reaching yeah. past, I mean, this is why, for example, like Aristotle described us as like uh, like above demons because we're like not yeah, quite exactly. demons, but we're not quite angels, and we're not quite totally. beasts, and we're they're these mess of of creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, do you guys, so, uh, I think that we live in, um, a, we're talking about propaganda cause that's my big thing is just propaganda. Cause I want people to make, you know, well-rounded decisions for their own lives, despite whatever crappy propaganda is out there. So I think we live in a really anti-natalist society. Like I understand what Kidology is saying, you know, that the cost of living is high and having children is high, but people have been reproducing in like dire straits for a very, very long time. Um, and I, and I just, I wonder about the impact of that. And if that's the right choice for people, I'm, I also grew up like low SES in the United States of America. So is American poverty, it's like not the same as some global abject poverty that's out <laughs> there, but it's like, you know, it was like bad enough. Um, and I'm still really glad that my mom had me and chose life. And a, a lot of women in my family that were low SES, uh, chose to have children, you know, not under the best circumstances, but they did it anyway. Um, and, and I would think that there's probably a lot of people out there that feel so intimidated about having a child that they wouldn't would never bother trying. And we've reproduced in the past. Like I, I make this joke a lot about uh, what we re, re, we reproduce during the Mesolithic, and that's because. Uh, a lot of the megafauna, so the large animals, a lot of them like died out when there was a big climate change and we were still having babies. And so it's like, I know times are tough now, but is it like so bad that we shouldn't be having kids? You know, I don't know about that. I try to be more optimistic. I, I are you religious? Me? Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm Christian. I've been Christian for like two years, but I knew I wanted to be a mom when I was 13. Can I ask, um, uh, just out of, out of curiosity, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, um, do we think that uh, having children is um, uh, an essential part of womanhood? In your opinion, Ali, please, uh, that you think that it's something that all women should, if they can, strive to do? Do you think it's a net good or do you think it's more of a neutral, everyone should choose for themselves type deal? I'm not familiar with your content. I'm mm -hmm. kind of getting familiar with what you're saying, but I don't want to put you. words in your mouth, right? Um, Let's see. So... I would wager to bet that majority of women want to be mothers. For some reason, a minority of women has been able to shape Western society. So I would say disagreeable, probably like more masculine academic types. Uh, Kyla has talked about this before. So the, basically these women get in academia and they're like, hey, I have this great idea, um, progressivism and feminism. Let's just do it for everybody. And it's like, uh, you know, like you might want to postpone having kids, but you know, does your average woman, I would say in general, a lot of women more so want to have children, but I don't think that they're meeting the right guy to do so. And that- What's the right guy? Oh my gosh. I mean, well, okay. You ever, okay, this, this is, is, this is going to be dark. Okay. Where well, this is going to be dark. Um, so for my position growing up low SES, and I lived in multiple neighborhoods throughout central Florida. And I also had family that was low SES and multi-ethnic family that still like low SES. Um, so a lot of people talk about when it comes to, am I allowed to use the word abortion on here? Yes, I don't think okay, it's... Okay, on YouTube you can't, so I'm a YouTuber. Um, oh. So a lot of people like to throw this this thing around, well, like, women are not having babies because they're, they're terminating their pregnancies and they're having abortions because um, they can't afford these kids. And growing up in the ghetto, I'm like, no, 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 no. If she likes that guy, she's going to have that guy's baby, whether she can afford it or not. Um, and I know people tend to disagree with that. I have just seen women move, like, hell or high water to have that guy's baby. So, like, when it comes to childless women, I think that they're just not meeting that guy who's going to, you know, kind of stir in, stir those... Uh, feminine instincts in her uh, and that's why i can't necessarily fall like 50.1 percent of women for being childless you know because if i hadn't met my husband i would have wanted to have a baby either i'm in my third trimester right now um so i guess that makes me biased but it's also taught me so much about being a woman thank you yeah i also had a miscarriage that taught me a lot about being a woman as well so i think that there's just this other very important part of being a woman that is being neglected because you'll hear the rebuttal there's well there is pressure for women to have children number one okay biological pressure is always going to be there but i think i'm hearing this a lot from women who grew up in two parent religious households possibly religious i think that's what i'm hearing it from um and i don't think that's true to life because if the pressure was there i don't think we would have 50.1 percent of women in the uk being childless by age 30. um so i think 
most women probably want to have kids. And I think that they're being sold a lie, again, through propaganda, that they're this special minority that wants to be childless. I and I think that's uh, really to, unfortunate. Just to push back just, just a, a small bit, I don't think feminism no. and progressivism necessarily discourages that. I think it just makes the option that they, if they don't want to, mm -hmm. um, that makes it more of an option, right? At least is my understanding. Yeah. Um, well, we're we're also a more educated we're more educated than we've ever been um okay. so we know that we, we know uh that women have different options now women had no options 50 years ago well that's so this largely due to feminism feminism I, spearheaded that it was the tip of the spear yeah. it got us in um uh, sure but, yeah. but now but now also that we have access access to like statistics education we know that pregnancy is not necessarily healthy for the body we know that there are a lot of complications we know how women are treated as mothers in a patriarchal society where men do not value femininity where men do not value motherhood the same way that they value uh what they call intellectualism or brute strength um, so like, I'm just, I'm just going to push back. <laughs> like, so on my YouTube channel, Go ahead. I interview wives, uh, all the time. And I try to interview wives that seem like they're in love with their husbands. Cause my, my great conspiracy is I think women are marrying men that they're not attracted to. And that's why they're leaving them. And, you know, can't blame them. I would leave too. Um, I think that for some reason, women are attributing the behavior of a small amount of, I don't know, malicious or apathetic men and attributing that to the whole a lot of the women I talk to who have husbands who have had children, their husbands love their kids and they want to be involved. Like this is a very, in my opinion, I think it's like a misandrous assumption that fathers don't want to be involved with their children. Now, like, does a father want to be involved with a woman who got pregnant after a one night stand? You know, probably not. But if that man loves that woman, he's going to love that kid just as much, if not more. I, I don't, I don't know why that's like the default position. Um, and I, I mean, I've been pregnant in a patriarchal society. It's been going pretty good for me. Obviously that's subjective um i will say i think people overhype the pregnancy privilege on the red pill side of things i don't think that is like legit nothing really awesome has happened for me so far um in terms of being large well, and in charge yeah and not in america where you only where you have like a maximum of six weeks to spend with your baby before you get back to work paid leave um so i think i i come from mm -hmm. the perspective of i'm a certified doula so i actually know a mm -hmm. lot about uh you know pregnancy I, a lot of this was in my curriculum, learning about different cultures, learning about how women are treated, how lonely pregnancy can be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, and I'm not saying that there aren't good men out there that are ready to be dads and ready to live like a good virtuous life. Um, I'm saying that as a whole, uh, in the way that society is made up, it, motherhood is just not as valued as being a CEO. Okay. It's um, just not. Yeah, I understand that. I, I just, I, I guess I'm trying to understand, right? Um, so do you feel like feminism today, Allie, if I may ask directly, do you think feminism today is a more harmful or a more helpful force in society overall? God. Oh God, I think it's so harmful. harmful. Um, okay. Can you give me yeah. a, just a brief couple examples? Oh, Cause I want to get other people in on this too, right? I want to give, yeah. get other opinions. I want to get, uh, mm -hmm. some other, uh, other thoughts in, but can you give me like a, maybe, maybe, maybe a brief example of some of the harms mm -hmm. it does? In your opinion? Um, yeah. So, okay. Let's say majority of women want to reproduce and obviously you'd want to be able to get a good man in order to do that. But then there's like the, the fear stoking of men, even though data and statistics really doesn't support it. Um, my thing is how the he double hockey sticks can you manage a long-term relationship with a man that you want to have kids with if you think that men are inherently oppressive like that is crazy to me i didn't even have a dad i did not even have a dad in my life and i can still go around and be like no, no, no. Like these men matter and these men are good. I mean, I have a brother, obviously I have a husband now. Um, men in the military helped me a lot. I think that changed my, per I, I mean, I didn't have like a disdain toward men, but I didn't have like a, a true sincere appreciation of men until I served in the military and I was helped by a lot of men. Do you um, think working there? Do you you think are cool as fuck. Laugh oh, just you. real quick. You are cool as fuck served in the military. Uh, uh, laugh, You're laugh. We can, we can laugh. Please, please, please. I mean, she's Wait, not wrong. Do you shut think, up. Yeah, do you think no, you are. You're pretty cool. That's that's impressive. Um and I want to make sure they say that. But I want to say, right, that I don't think that uh feminism in and of itself is what's causing this uh uh people to think feel men are just oppressive force. Right. Like I know that uh maybe the women who are considered themselves feminists can maybe back me up here. What 
is is there anything well, yeah. to what she's saying? What do can you think? we can we back up history a little bit? Because when we're talking about like birth rates specifically, we've all neglected to mention the fact that the more educated and wealthy a country is, the birth rate declines always. In fact, the more higher in socioeconomic status you are, the lower your birth rate is as well. Probably in part because the more rich you are and the more educated you are, the more fearful of the future you are. And that like, these are the people that will be like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to have a kid. Like, I don't have a hundred K income yet. And it's just like, bro, like you don't need it, right? Like rich people are very like silly and they're like overly cautious about having children to like a maximal degree. So like, this is a really, really strong thing. Is is feminists like? Can you restate your question, Wick? Now that we've like backed up to there, <laughs> fair Are enough. Feminists destroying Do, men. Does feminism, as a rule, like uh, posit that men are overall an oppressive force that is oppressing Not women? Not necessarily. So Explain, feminism, please. as I understand it, is viewing the world in a perspective in which women are generally, um, women's needs and women's, uh, women's perspectives are secondary to men. That d does that mean that men specifically are oppressive? Not necessarily, but women are operating from a place where their, their opinion, their perspective is viewed as secondary to men's. Um, uh, we can talk about like terms like the patriarchy. I don't really use terms like the patriarchy very often. Um, uh, but, um, uh, because it, because it's kind of something that polarizes people nowadays. Um, I yeah. would say that, um, I would say that men suffer, uh, from the, the existing s system just as women suffer. Um, uh, I would say that, um, feminism is, is, I personally think feminism is great, um, because, uh, feminists ha have historically been people who have fought for, um, family benefits for have they have pushed for benefits for for women for reproductive um, uh, uh, you know rights and and for things like that um, uh, but but not just reproductive rights but specifically for the family um, and for paid parental leave right um, yeah. those are things that are incredibly beneficial towards um, women and men and children um, and so I don't think that um, it, sure there are going to be like some people who you know, uh, who uh, the, the super loud minority who are screaming about how all men are oppressive and evil. Right. Um, I think the average feminist, um, uh, does not think that men are evil or oppressive necessarily. The average feminist just views the world in the way that it historically has been in that women's perspectives were secondary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, simply, like, feminism isn't doing it, but feminists definitely are, right? Like, like third wave rad femmes, unironically, were, like, were engaging in, like, unironic misandrous man hate. Um, they were rewriting oh, history. I engage in it. I know you do. <laughs> All right. They were rewriting history Happily. to just be this story of just men oppressing women when it was actually just rich men oppressing everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't really, I, I think in the past, I'd like to blame feminism. Um, and I've realized more recently that it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of like any other institution. There's a pro lot of problems in the institution and the movement, but it's the, the real people to blame are the people, right? It's the feminist. It's the specific feminist doing the behaviors, like shitting on men and treating men horribly. Like th these are the problems, not the ideology itself, which I've kind of gotten around to acknowledging. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know. Also well, what, one of the things that really stresses me out when we kind of start categorizing feminism as men hating, because obviously there is some sort of correlative here that we're all noticing and observing. But what I think feminism is engaging in right now is it's really tackling the relationship that women have to rape. And what we're going to see when this conversation is unpacked is that we're seeing a lot of trauma, right? We're seeing a lot of trauma emerge. And people aren't necessarily good when they're in their most traumatized space, right? And so when you're kind of in that headspace, when everyone around you is talking about rape, when everyone's sharing their story, and you're constantly in a deluge of like, like, uh, triggering information online. I can't even log on anymore without like seeing some sort of cancellation because someone was raped. It's just like, it's horrifying. So one of the issues is that you have a lot of women, like Kyla is pointing out, who are individually triggered and they're and, and individually they might have these biases against men, much like incels have biases against women. And I think what's really important is that we meet people where they're at rather than this mass condemnation. Mm -hmm. I also, I also think that because of, I don't think that the patriarchy is current. Right. I don't think that the the patriarchy, every single man right now is upholding the patriarchy. Every single man is evil. Not really. I'll be inflammatory to get, you know, views and attention on fucking Twitter and be inflammatory, but not really. Right. 
but they are functioning off of a set of rules that have been uh, naturalized for <laughs> decades now. So there are certain traits that men have that are like arrogance that persist throughout their personalities and even in their actions that now are like obviously very triggering, right? And I think that these are the men that you would probably say are not well suited for marriage or for fatherhood. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's just like a lot of them out there and you found a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I wouldn't say like, I mean, I don't know if you're done making your point, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't even necessarily say that arrogance is um, like inherently bad in a man, right? So like we're talking about these dominating, domineering men, which I don't think would even be most men. I think a lot of men these days, we have this crisis of masculinity. You guys have heard about it online <laughs> to, to no end, really. Uh, nobody wants to talk about a crisis of femininity. So I think that there are right now a lot more men that are less dominant i'll use the terms alpha and beta but that requires like so much less to, to that more to talk about um it's just for you guys to understand like an abstract concept okay so i think that there's like a lot more beta men these days than there are alpha men and so when we're talking about like the arrogance which would be like narcissism in men um successful men attractive men have to be disagreeable to an extent in order to be successful in the first place so that we can like see them as viable mates. If he's trying to be successful in earnest, like that's very cool, good for him. Um, so like we see these things and we're like, oh, that is so awful. But does anybody really want to be with an unsuccessful man? And it doesn't even just have to be like profession. It can be, you know, like a contextual social hierarchies, just having a successful man in the first place. Because immediately everyone goes to like the high status professions. And it's like, no, um, there are men that are earning less than six figures that are considered, um, you know, competent in whatever hierarchy they found for themselves. So I, I just I think that's really interesting that we have to go to. It's just the small pool of arrogant, domineering men that we low key kind of find attractive because we don't necessarily want to be dealing with the men who would just say yes to everything and everybody. But this is uh, one of my, my issues with when we're. We're, we're, we're lost in kind of trying to define what female and what male are is that as we've kind of already defined that there's there's different people in different material circumstances right so uh, you know pre-industrial society is not necessarily going to have the same expectations on the individual um, and, th and that's going to change how people relate to their gender roles as they're prescribed and I think likewise even in a single country you're going to have people at different different classes they're going to have different gender roles thrust upon them because of those classes and so I think when we try to make these like mass generalizations we just end up kind of it ends up sounding kind of conspiratorial and I think also it ends up telling people who they are when they're standing there saying that's not my experience and I think it's so much easier to just imagine us as having different experiences yes there is something to gender I think what kidology reminds us is I think for me personally gender is co-created right I think there are really affirmative like existentially affirmative experiences I can have with gender and those are often created with other people and how I feel in relationship to them but I think gender is this assigned category to like a centralize a single person is always going to kind of fall a bit flat and you're just always going to be making these like very vague generalizations that don't really help us like address some of these mm -hmm. some of these crises which we all see like we all seem to agree that there are these certain crises mm -hmm. I like um, that I, idea I don't, that gender is mm -hmm. that gender is co-created and I'm, I'm kind of actually um Ali kind of responding mm -hmm. to your initial point like your your way back point at this point but I find these conversations about the woman experience really interesting because again i am a person who lacks for instance the um the reproduction uh instinct i lack that instinct mm -hmm. and i chose a fabulous partner i'm engaged and um i chose Congrats. that partner partially based on the fact that in our lifestyles we don't want to have children and so this idea that we are that at least traditional women are choosing people based on um, their success as their individual gender is just, I, I don't even have a question for it. I just find it really fascinating to hear you guys talk about it. Um, so I'm trying to understand your last sentence. Do you think you can repeat it? my last sentence that yeah like because i'm trying to it was, sorry these are these are like it's not necessarily in my wheelhouse so there's like there's a lot of things that you guys say that i have to like try to understand as you're saying them um you were talking about like success per, are... per, per gender yeah yeah because when you're mm -hmm. talking about when you were talking about like who you would want to be with or presumably who you are with you know you mm -hmm. were talking about their success either um monetarily or socially as a mm -hmm. man 
And yeah. so like that is, I, I mean, I just, I understand oh, okay. this because you're attracted to men specifically, but I, I find it really mm-hmm. fascinating. Yeah. Well, like I mean, most people are going to be heterosexual, right? So that's like, we can talk yeah. about these generalizations all day long, but it's, you know, like most people are going to do what most people do. Um, so in terms of like what's attractive, so I'm just, I'm just being honest. So I ran the metrics of what was an average man. So he's five foot nine, he's overweight or obese, and he's earning less than 50,000 a year because I kept hearing from women that they were just kind of think like, oh, I am in an average marriage. And so my, my perspective on that was like, no, 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 I don't think that we are dating average men. So it like, it depends depends on the metrics that you're looking at. Um, cause people like see that I'm light skinned, uh, conservative, pregnant, married. And you know, there's a lot of us and I'm just like, Oh, clearly you just want this like white collar doctor situation. Although that's like kind of what I got going on. I call it periwinkle collar. Um, but other women find men that are competent in their own social realms to be attractive anyway, even if the money's not there. Like, uh, I actually, I asked, uh, Erudite, you know, cause they were trying to flame her. She's a progressive wife on my, on my channel. And I asked her, I was like, so like, what do you look up? Uh, what do you admire about your husband? And the laundry list was long, you know? So like, might not be a millionaire, but he's got a lot going for him. And I think we, we really neglect that, but I, I would just encourage women to listen to their bodies because uh, I thought all this stuff was nonsense for a very long time because uh, I didn't know that there were different like hierarchies of men different qualities of men and that's just life you know I'm not even the t- the top tier quality woman I've seen Japanese women they scare me they frighten me very competitive um but you know once I way. had she means they're very yeah. attractive Weppy was uncertain what that meant <laughs> oh yeah well so I started thinking about this because I started listening to my ovaries and I would look around and I would think in public when I was looking at men, uh, yes, I would sleep with him. No, I wouldn't. Mm. I had way more no's than I had yeses, but it's because I started thinking like, well, what, what does like my vagina think is attractive? What are my ovaries like? Granted women have types, but I was just starting to see across the board. There are some objectively physically masculine things that we think are cute. Have I heard men open their mouths and say things that made me stop thinking they were attractive immediately? Uh, yes, but that would be, you know, the, the first premise is, do I want to sleep with you upon like gazing upon you? Mm -hmm. So I know it's like, we want to very much theoretically get into gender discussions and you guys are, this is y'all's wheelhouse. You really enjoy this, but, um, life is a lot simpler for some folks out there. If you just kind of listen to your body and what it likes. Yeah, I think I think the issue is like I understand their hesitancy to generalize in in many ways because like generalizations tend not to apply to me very well, right? Like I'm a person who falls into a niche that like a lot of these normative statements don't fit me super well. The problem is that they're normative because they apply to like probably 60% of the population to some extent, right? I think I think Webby though you touch on something that's really important when talking about like gender norms, which is like rigidity of gender norms, right? A lot of times particularly in like trad uh, traditional movements, we're going to see like a re- a rigid conception of gender that arises and then they start kind of putting the like the law i've been saying this all stream but the, like the law before the principle so they'll say like women must be like this when it's like well no in most heterosexual relationships women tend to do those things because they like them more and they're better at them but that doesn't mean that it should be like this rigid rule and i think like that's a large problem that's kind of emerged in like the 20th century essentially is, is our contention with gender because previously especially like the, the Christian traditional movement just tried to like rigidly inform of being like, well, even if your wife's a mechanic, the man's got to take care of the car because he's a man. And it's like, that's insane. That's stupid. That doesn't even make any sense. Right. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I also, uh, I would also, there are some biological truths. Like you want someone who is healthy looks, you know, like he, you would have healthy offspring. Um, but then there are other, uh, I'm, I'm reading this book, woman hating by Andrea Dworkin right now. And uh, a lot of our reality is informed by like the fairy tales that we listen to when we when we were young, um, where like, uh, you know, we have these like valiant soldier men, basically. And that's and that's when you'll be happy is when when you meet this successful, brave, uh, you know, man, which, you know, is accurate. But I also think that it's a uh, we're in a capitalistic society in which the only luxuries we can afford, the only way we could be truly comfortable is if we find some semblance of of you know, comfortability. So success, money means that you can live a comfortable lifestyle in which you're not living to work, right? Like, I think that most women, uh, I think that it's in feminine nature to be, uh, you know, to relax. I think that I think that uh, men are more um, restless, like naturally, biologically. And so I think that women will sort of naturally 
Um, this is an essentialist view. Uh, but I think that women will sort of naturally try to find men who can give them a lifestyle in which they do not probably have to work as much as they want. They're obviously outliers of women who really want to work. But yeah, I think that I think that you talk about a lot of this, like it's mostly biological. And I would probably say that I would probably say it's probably 50 50 on the fact mm-hmm. that we live in a capitalistic society and, and also bio- biological. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I disagree it's... that like some of it's, you know, like social, but I, we, I think when we're thinking about, you know, gender roles and stuff like that, um, we, we got to look at it through, I think Chesterton's fence is what it, what it's called. I suck at the story so bad, whatever. All I know is these two dudes, they saw a fence and one guy said, I want to knock down this fence. And the other guy told him and he said, Hey, before you knock down the fence, you might want to find out why it's there in the first place. So like my issue is when we're always reeling against these gender roles, it blinds you from finding out which ones are going to work within your relationship that you wouldn't have known unless you tried. That's how I ended up in uh, in more traditional values in my relationship in the first place. My husband thought he wanted like independent boss, babe, uh, triathlete, physicist, everything. And it turns out he just really likes a woman who, you know, makes him breakfast in the morning. And I, I like making him breakfast in the morning. I did undergrad. I did all of that. And I was a, I was even a supervisor in the military. So I got promoted in three years. Um, and like how sweet he is when I feed him just means so much more than any A I got on any paper ever. And I honestly, I hated undergrad. So, um, <laughs> that's, that's the only caution that I have is like, cause that's what these general rules are for. Cause I'm on the red pill side of things. And I would say like, I'm kind of on the conservative side of things or Republicans irritate me, but like the point of it is to see, okay, in general, does this does this woman like flowers? Let me get her the flowers. In general, does this man like a sandwich? Let me make him a sandwich. If it doesn't work, then you know that that gender stereotype was a miss, and you have to cater your behavior to that person's personality. It's it's not all gonna hit. Like there there's men that like to cook. You know what I mean? And there's women who hate cleaning, and there's somehow they manage to marry like a type A guy who loves cleaning. So this stuff is to be negotiated. I just don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to some of these gender things. Um, and I wouldn't say that it's all biological because we're not we're not living in the in the environment that we're adapted to. So, you know, times are different. I would call it just yin and yang. Right. Like, I think that mm-hmm. I think that gender ought to mean feminine and masculine, not male and female. So I think that, you know, if you if you were very type A, if you were very masculine, you wanted to stay in the military, you wanted to rank up. I think that you would naturally find some a man who was more feminine. Uh, I, I think I found that in my relationship, I'm engaged to a man who's, um, almost my direct counterpart. Like he's a, you know, he owns a company very successful, but in disposition, I am the more masculine one and he is the more feminine one just in conversation. And I think that that's our yin and yang. Like it's very, I think that we will naturally find that. And I don't think that that's, you know, necessarily sexed probably is mostly, but 